In a way, this video is a potential future story of Mars. While certainly not set in stone, this period in human history seems almost fixated on finally putting human feet on that planet. And while it is currently a very harsh world, with a whole lot of distance to cross between Earth and there, both of which are enormous problems, they do seem to be surmountable. Whether through the activities of government-sponsored exploration, or through private exploration and even colonization of Mars, Mars is on the table as being enough like Earth to eventually become a second home for humans. But visiting and colonizing Mars is really about exporting Earth's biosphere. At first, we will bring that biosphere with us, living in little bubbles of something like Earth's atmosphere, where we and our food and our symbiotic microbes can survive. We do this already with our space stations and spacecraft in Earth orbit, and of course the Apollo missions where humans survived on the moon, albeit for only brief visits. Mars is much harder given its distance. Even at its closest passes to Earth, it's still very far away, so if you were there, you couldn't expect much help from Earth if something went wrong, at least in the immediate sense. If a rescue mission was needed, it's going to take many months, and you'd have to make do with what you have until help arrived. But can this equation be changed? Two possibilities come to mind. One is something for the next few centuries, which is to alter humans genetically to be more compatible with Mars. We don't yet know all of the medical issues that will arise from living on that world, and everything from the effects of lower gravity in space to the long-term effects of interacting with the Martian environment are concerns. Few things are ever truly sealed. See the Apollo missions, where moon dust was always clinging to the suits, to the point that the astronauts reported that the lunar dust smelled like gunpowder, and that was only short-term. Imagine what a Mars colony will deal with over a period of years wandering the Martian surface in modified spacesuits. But as these issues become clearer, it may be advantageous to adapt humans genetically to be more resilient in a Martian environment. Perhaps some method of surviving cold temperatures or lower atmospheric pressure just in case of exposure, as a sort of hybrid Earth-Mars-Human plus, or at least humans more suited for diseases and conditions that might arise on Mars. Going further gets harder without merging with technology. It seems we are much further away from a human that could just walk around Mars indefinitely without going full-on technological, though a human downloaded into a robotic body should, in principle, be eventually on the table. But the other approach is to simply make Mars into another Earth, and this is where it gets really interesting. To terraform Mars to be compatible with humanity as we are right now, we would need to radically change and beef up its atmosphere and warm that planet up significantly. But not actually that much, at least at the equator. Mars is a very cold planet, but it actually overlaps with Earth. The lowest temperatures on Earth can get significantly lower than the highest temperatures on Mars. Mars's equator, for example, can see temperatures of up to 70 degrees Fahrenheit or about 20 degrees Celsius. With a thicker atmosphere made up of the right gases, Mars could become much warmer, and indeed was in the past, as the abundant evidence of past liquid water shows. But that does not mean you can simply take off your spacesuit at Mars's equator and walk around. The biggest problem with that is Mars's atmospheric pressure. No matter where you go on the surface of that planet, it's very, very low, less than a percent of what we have here on Earth. Very low temperature like that is very bad for the human body very quickly. Water boils at human body heat levels at sufficiently low pressures as are present on Mars. You might handle 60 to 90 seconds of exposure and recover, but beyond that, it's death. And even then, it gets very unpleasant very quickly. One instance where a human was exposed to a near vacuum resulted in rapid unconsciousness, with the subject's last memory being the saliva on his tongue beginning to boil. The point is, you need to carry something close to your home atmosphere and your home atmospheric pressure anywhere you go on Mars. You must live in a bubble on that planet, at least for now. And there are many other issues, such as lower gravity and what that does to a human over long periods of time, which is not yet entirely clear. There are potential ways to mitigate those effects, but the point is, even on a fully terraformed Mars, there are still going to be other issues to solve. But to actually thicken up and terraform Mars's atmosphere, you face several problems. Some of these include how to actually accomplish terraforming, 
and we have some ideas there. The second is how to hold on to that atmosphere. Mars has lost most of what it originally had, and will slowly lose much of what we add. And third, how to make humans more adapted to the new environment of Mars, a planet where we did not evolve. These are just a few of the major questions. Other issues that might be easier to solve being how to make Mars a soil useful for growing food. It isn't in its current state with toxic perchlorate everywhere and so on. We won't see cornfields and algae on Mars for quite a while yet. But what would a terraformed Mars look like in the far future? The simple answer is a lot like Earth. We would in many ways be recreating Earth's atmosphere and biosphere on that world, though there would be notable differences. The obvious terraforming gases at first are carbon dioxide and water vapor, both of which Mars has. But if you can manufacture them on Mars or otherwise get them there, there's also CFCs and various other fluorine compounds. We have CFCs here on Earth, and we put them in the atmosphere, and they damaged the ozone layer. These are artificial chemicals, such as banned refrigerants, though recent work suggests that there may be natural ways for some of them to exist. But at the levels we're talking about with Mars, there's no good mechanism other than a civilization doing it. The reason for using fluorine compounds to warm up Mars is because they are thousands of times more efficient as greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide is. To start melting Mars' polar caps to release carbon dioxide, a large amount of CFCs or other fluorine compounds would need to be released into the atmosphere. This can take the form of manufacturing them in situ on Mars, which seems to have more fluorine available than Earth, or bombarding Mars with rockets that release the chemicals in compressed form into the atmosphere, though this would need a very large amount of launches. To do it, you'd need a serious amount of these chemicals, tens of millions of tons, and indeed about three times more than what we've produced globally on Earth since the early 1970s to when production of CFCs was largely banned in the early 90s. These chemicals would also be destroyed continuously in the atmosphere of Mars, thus would need to be replenished on a constant basis. That said, these methods could warm Mars up rather quickly, in as short of a time as a decade if sufficient effort were put into it. Also worth noting is that Mars also has water ice, and as mentioned, water vapor is also a potent greenhouse gas. Water also has the benefit of containing oxygen and being very important to Earth life in general. But this is not enough. Even more gases are going to be needed, such as nitrogen and ammonia. Asteroids and comets can be rich in these, so the obvious way of delivering them to Mars is through impacts, which isn't a great thing to do if there's a bubble colony already existing there. And there is the question of how much oxygen you will initially have. Initially, and here meaning a very, very long time, thousands of years, even if you had atmospheric pressure that a human could withstand, and protection against other environmental hazards, you'd still need a breathing apparatus until the Martian atmosphere could be oxygenated, presumably by plant life, to Earth levels. And even then, the gas most needed to increase atmospheric pressure on Mars is likely going to be carbon dioxide, which you can't breathe either. But there are several sources of oxygen on Mars. The aforementioned water that we could produce oxygen from with enough electricity, but also the carbon dioxide and metal oxides on the planet. And interestingly enough, the very perchlorate that would cause toxicity for plants and humans on Mars also happens to be useful in chemical oxygen generators. And there are also hydrocarbons such as methane. There are significant sources for these in the solar system, particularly Titan, which has a massive amount of them. But the common problem among all these gases to varying degrees is that Mars both loses its atmospheric gases and they also get broken down. Mars just cannot hold on to a significant atmosphere, though in fairness, it does take a very long time for it to lose it. But there may be ways to protect Mars, at least partially from atmospheric loss. The most obvious method here is to give Mars an artificial magnetosphere. There have been several proposed ways to do this. One would be to create an artificial ring, or system of superconducting rings encircling Mars with electric current moving through them creating a magnetic field. Another was proposed by NASA chief scientist Jim Green where a magnetic dipole field is created in between Mars and the Sun at the planet's L1 Lagrange point. This would create a partial magnetic shield. 
These methods benefit from also helping Mars to naturally rebuild its own atmosphere due to lessened atmospheric loss, creating conditions for natural, albeit slow, terraforming. So in the end, it is possible, though difficult, to transform Mars into a second home for humans. No doubt there will also be many unforeseen challenges involved, but in the end, it would have the ultimate benefit of ensuring our survival in this star system as a multi-planet species. Indeed, it may be that most civilizations in the universe, when reaching a certain level, will venture out and colonize the other planets of their star system. Or even neighboring star systems. And this is where this all gets very interesting indeed. A terraformed Mars and humanity settling nearby star systems should in principle be very visible to anyone else in the galaxy that might be studying our solar system from afar. The first thing an alien civilization would likely note about the star system is Earth. As someone else's exoplanet, Earth has been broadcasting the existence of its biosphere for several billion years. The planet's mix of unusually high levels of oxygen, with some mechanism replenishing it, would look odd and suggest photosynthesis. More is Earth's red edge, where the plant life here becomes very reflective in infrared, almost mirror-like and the presence of methane, also being replenished by some mechanism. Taken together, all of this would strongly suggest to alien astronomers that there is life here. As to detecting our civilization, this is significantly harder since we've only been technologically visible for just over a century. But say they could. They might detect CFCs in our own atmosphere, or even glean hints of our artificial lighting and of course our radio. But a terraformed Mars changes this equation significantly. Presuming the alien astronomers have advanced knowledge of planetary science, they might conclude that terraformed Mars is, well, an impossible planet. They might be able to work out that the conditions, age, and size of Mars is insufficient to support and maintain the terraformed atmosphere it would present. It's worth noting here that the conditions of a world holding on to an atmosphere is key. A good example here is Titan, where it maintains a very thick atmosphere, which is thought is partly due to Saturn's magnetosphere exercising a protective effect, along with other factors, some of which are not yet fully understood. But none of them apply to Mars. It's a world that could not maintain a thick atmosphere, and there are likely many other worlds just like Mars out there in the galaxy. At our present level, this type of impossible planet would be difficult to detect, but as our instruments and capabilities improve, if we ever saw something like this, it would at least be on the table as a technosignature. But there's more. It's also possible, though more difficult, to terraform Venus, and it too might present a similar technosignature to Mars. Taken across the board, an impossible planet, a naturally habitable garden world, and a mostly impossible planet outside the star's habitable zone, would strongly indicate that someone was actively changing the planets of this star system. At any rate, food for thought, but I leave you with one last impossible planet possibility. How about a planet that should have an atmosphere but doesn't? What natural cataclysm could cause that other than perhaps an unusually massive sustained bombardment by comets and asteroids? Or it could be even stranger. If you saw a planet with a very pure atmosphere, perhaps some very non-reactive or inert gas, perhaps held at unusually cold temperatures, maybe through the use of starshades, we might not readily be able to see, then what might that suggest? Such a planet would seem to overwhelmingly not suggest biology, but the extreme purity of such an atmosphere might not suggest nature either. Much debate would be needed within the scientific community, but maybe, just maybe, we might have detected a world terraformed by a machine civilization. And if that's the case, then how did that come about? Was that habitable zone world once biological? What happened to its biology? Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.